I'm going to start on a certain, a, a different note, uh, keeping in tune with the, the French uh, aspect of this. I'm going to quote from, uh, from World War II French war hero, Antoine d'Exupéry, who wrote this little novella, uh, Le Petit Prince, uh, the, the Little Prince. Uh, I don't want to misquote him, and, and so I'm going to read what the meaning of what he said, how he presented it. He said, the main, the, the main theme of The Little Prince is the importance of looking beneath the surface to find the real truth and the real meaning of a thing. It is the fox who teaches the prince to see with one's heart instead of just with one's eyes. Unfortunately, says the author, most adults have trouble doing this. <laughs> well, we've talked a little bit about insanity here, right? Uh, Colonel Black asks, have we all gone mad? A very legitimate question, given the nuclear aspect of all this stuff. Let me just address that very briefly by saying that Colonel Black was one of the main signers, one of 21, uh, who signed our Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity Memorandum to President Biden on 1 May. And, and what we said was mirrored just one week later by the head of the CIA and by the National Intelligence Director before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, Averill Haynes, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, said to Senator, I guess, Senator Warner from Virginia, she said, now, Senator, uh, we don't want nuclear war. We think that one of the main things that might prompt nuclear war is if Putin feels that he is about to be defeated in Ukraine. Now, she's an intelligence director. She doesn't make the policy. <laughs> but the policy clearly should be, hello, let's not make Putin perceive that he's going to be defeated in Ukraine. Otherwise, he may use nuclear weapons. I mean, anyhow, but the policy is different, isn't it? The policy is, therefore, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and many other politicians, therefore, we want total victory, as has already been said. We want total defeat for Putin. Doesn't make any sense. The author is right in saying adults really have difficulty understanding what this all means beneath the surface. Um, I keep asking myself why it is that President Biden felt it necessary, oh, I think it was about six weeks after he took office, to, to address the Chinese challenge, right? And what he said was something equivalent to China is trying to become the most powerful country in the world economically and, and um, militarily. That's not going to happen on my watch. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Are the Chinese aggressively oriented? Not if you know anything about Chinese civilization for the last several millennia. Do they have a lot of work to do right in their own country? They sure do, and they're doing it well. Uh, so the Chinese have this bizarre concept that you can have a win-win a situation. You know, like both sides, like we used to say, can't we just get along? <laughs> well, there's a long story behind that, of course. Uh, we need an enemy if we want to feed the, the defense contractors and have them feed our politicians and have them appropriate more money for, well, so you know that story. In any case, you know, if you look deeper, if you look under the surface, why not? Why not a win-win situation? Now, Vladimir Putin put it a little differently. Uh, some of you may remember, because it was just nine years ago, uh, that we were on the verge of war against Syria, open war, 
tomahawk missiles and that kind of thing, okay? Who bailed Obama out? Well, the fellow's name happened to be Vladimir Putin. What did he say? He said, we know you guys are accusing Bashar al-Assad, pre president of, of Syria, uh, for uh, launching a chemical attack outside Damascus. We don't think that's right. We think you've been mousetrapped, but nevertheless, we've done a deal with the Syrians. We've agreed with them to load up all their chemical weapons uh, under UN supervision and have them destroyed if you'll allow it on one of your warships specifically um, outfitted to destroy chemical weapons. And Obama said, really? Because Kerry didn't tell him about that, but they were working on it. And the reason I mention all that is because that was the zenith. That was the high point of relations between the United States of America and Russia over recent decades. What happened? Well, Putin wrote a, my God, did he write? Yeah, he actually wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. The date was 12 September, 2003, print edition. And what did he say? Well, he addressed this win-win. He addressed this, why can't we get along? Uh, because he saw it was coming because of what Obama had just said in a major speech. Here's Putin writing in the New York Times. We can avoid force in Syria, and this will improve the atmosphere in international relations and strengthen mutual trust. Quote, my working and personal relationship with President Obama is marked by growing trust. I appreciate this. I would rather disagree with a case he made on American exceptionalism, stating that the United States policy is what makes America different. It makes us exceptional. It's extremely dangerous to encourage people to see themselves as exceptional. The big countries, small countries, rich and poor, those with long democratic traditions, and those still finding their way to democracy. Their policies differ too. We are all different. But when we ask for God's blessings, we must not forget that God created us equal. God created us equal. Does that ring any bells? In other words, what Putin is saying is, look, uh, you, Mr. President, brag about being exceptional. You need to know, even in this very conciliatory, hopeful, op-ed. I don't agree. I think all nations are the same in terms of whether they're exceptional or not. And you should know that right off the bat. Now, one little token of that comes to mind. That is, uh, it's dearly good after every speech to say, God bless the United States of America. Huh. That's interesting, isn't it? There's nothing in Judeo-Christian biblical literature that allows anyone, even the President of the United States, to use the imperative voice with God. God, you bless the United States of America. The rest of the people, well, that's at your discretion, but you bless. Hear it, God? Bless the United States of America. I mean, there's <laughs> a little symptom of what we're up against. Now, there is another way. And I don't know if uh, many of uh, our viewers here know Kirk, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, the novelist, but uh, he was a, the supreme humanist, agnostic, and yet he was very, very clear in pointing to a, a different way of doing things. You should, re, you should know that uh, Kurt was in the 106th Infantry Division during the Battle of the Bulge, was captured by the Germans, taken to taken to a German city, Dresden, yeah, Dresden, just before all those incendiary bombings uh, that took place, U.S. Air Force, Britain. And he hid out in a meat locker during those uh, bombings with the other POWs. And when they could come out into the open, 
uh, the task fell to them to disinter all the bodies, copious corpses, and then reinter them if they could find a piece of grass uh, beneath the rubble. Why do I say all this? I say all this because Vonnegut knew humanity at its worst. He knew he was there. He watched people do those kinds of things to other people. Now, years later, uh, someone asked Vonnegut, and once again, I would, I would uh, emphasize that he was a uh, humanist. So, uh, you know, that means an agnostic. He said, well, uh, Kirk, uh, Kurt, uh, what do you think of, <clears throat> of Jesus of Nazareth? Again, I don't want to misquote him. This is what he said. I say of, of Jesus, as all humanists do, if what he said is good, and so much of it is absolutely beautiful, what does it matter if he was God or not? If Jesus hadn't delivered the Sermon on the Mount with its message of mercy and pity, I wouldn't want to be a human being. I'd just as soon be a cockroach. Kurt Vonnegut. Just as soon be a cockroach. Well, he referred to, he referred to the Sermon on the Mount here, and uh, I looked it up again uh, just this morning. I'd like to just cite like four of the eight so-called Beatitudes and kind of expatiate on why they might not apply to this situation and how far away American exceptionalism is in relation to these Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek. Hmm. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Hmm, justice, wow. Justice means everybody's equal, right? Um, no exceptions. <laughs> no exceptions and no exceptionalism. <laughs> if I read that right, okay. Blessed are the peacemakers. Hmm. This is, get this one, this is the last one. Blessed are you when people insult you, slander you, persecute you. Uh, be glad about that. You're in good company. That's exactly what they did to the earlier prophets. That's easier said than done, but I think we need to do that. We need to keep doing that. And there's a, a typical American trait that I've run into where people are reluctant to do something that they might not be successful in, you know? In other words, who wants to be laughed at? Who wants to go out and do something on principle and then have people say, Ray, what did you think you were doing by, by uh, turning your back on, on a, a warmonger uh, political figure? So there's this natural reluctance not to do things that our heart underneath the surface would prompt us to do. And one of my prophets is uh, Daniel Berrigan, who would have been 101 just last month. And, and what he said was, look, you know, after we did that action in outside of Baltimore, uh, burning draft cards, uh, we were in the only uh, federal office building in this small little town, it was a, a post office. And we're sitting around and I'm thinking to myself, whoa, this was a big action. Uh, was it worth doing? Uh, were we crazy? That's what everyone will say. Um, were we just trying to grab attention or what was it worth doing? And then says Daniel Berrigan, it occurred to me, look, Dan, <laughs> the good is worth doing because it's good. Now, results are, are not unimportant, but they're secondary to the goodness of the act. 
you got to go ahead and do it, okay? Now, Nan Berrigan was not only a courageous person, he was a poet. And he was also, he had a great sense of humor. And I cite this because doing this work, uh, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to need to have a good sense of humor. And as Dan relates what happened next after he had come to this insight in the uh, in in this little small post office, there were about eight of them there, and his brother Phil was in his clerics. You know, he's all dressed up in his uh, clerics, Roman collar and all. And as Dan ex ex expresses it, he says, "Well, just then, portentously, the door swings open." And in comes the paradigm of an FBI inspector. And he looks around the room and he sees my brother Phil and he says, Oh, you again! <laughs> I'm going to change my religion! <laughs> and, and Dan writes, No higher compliment could come to my brother Phil. <laughs> okay. So you got to keep a light sense here during these tough times. And you've got to remember that. You know, when we talk about rules-based order, some sort of substitute for the UN or Westphalia, for God's sake, the rules-based order, well, there's one rule that's more important than all the others. The greatest of these is love. Helga mentioned this. We need to all remember that deep down underneath, we need to understand these other people we need to try in a gentle way, as gently as we can, to disabuse themselves of the notion that they are exceptional, that they can, well, rule the rest of the world. It's not going to happen anyway, but the sooner we all realize that, the better. I'm talking about we Americans, of course. I'd like to close with, with two things, and, and that is a little quote from Théard de Chardin. Quote, the day will come when, after harnessing the winds, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness the energies of love. We shall harness the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. This comes from his book, Fire of love. And in finishing, I just simply need to cite Friedrich Schiller, uh, under whose name this institute uh, exists. And uh, some of you will recognize the words because uh, Beethoven uh, decided he would steal them as well. They are alle Menschen werden Brüder und Schwestern. All men are brothers and sisters. Uh, we can get through this, just have to remember that. And remember that of all the rules-based orders, the greatest of these is love. Thank you very much.